Hello, everyone. Before we start today, let me introduce to you all. Yeah, as you're waiting for the session to begin, I would like to introduce you to the Med Memo. The Med Memo is your one-stop guide to all things medical. You may be wondering, how does the Med Memo work? Articles or visual graphics related to all things medical will be posted weekly in the Med Memo's Instagram page. It is absolutely free of charge for premium members. However, if you're not a premium member, you will have to pay a small fee of RM5. Access to the Med Memo is for your lifetime and anyone and everyone can sign up for it. You don't have to be a Taylor student or a club member. If you're thinking of applying to medical school or not sure what to do in the medical field, we highly encourage you to apply now because the Med Memo will prepare you for your future. Here's the Google form to register. This lets us know your Instagram username so you, we will be able to give you access to the Med Memo. So good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for Know It All. My name is Evangeline and I'll be your host tonight. I hope you'll enjoy tonight's session and take away something useful from it. Today, we'll be focusing on studying medicine in Hong Kong. And joining us is the lovely Emily Chong. She's a second year medical student in the University of Hong Kong. And she will be sharing with us today information about her medical school and her experiences of how she got to where she is today. So here's a rough idea of what we will be doing tonight. We'll start off the event with a talk by Emily, followed by a Q&A session at the end for everyone to clarify any doubts that you may have. And you can ask her all your burning questions. Feel free to type your questions in the Slido link provided in the chat box as we proceed with the event. Kindly refrain from typing questions into the Zoom chat box and be sure to use the Slido link. Before we begin, make sure to read the housekeeping rules posted in the chat box and please abide by the rules or else we will not hesitate to remove you from the meeting. And please be respectful to our speaker. Without further ado, Emily, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Evangeline. Um, I'll start sharing my screen now. Uh, good night or good evening, everyone. My name is Emily and I'm currently a year two medical student at HKU Med. And it is a great honor for Taylor's uh, College Pre-Medical Society to invite me and to share this information with you guys. So here's the breakdown for tonight. For tonight. I, will, I will start by giving a, a brief introduction to my background, what I did for my pre-university studies, and also why I chose Hong Kong, and followed by um, an explanation on how the application process goes. Then I'll talk a bit about life in Hong Kong and um, like the living expenses or the activities that you can do here. And lastly, well, not lastly, uh, I'll talk about the scholarships, the opportunities. And lastly, I'll talk about the medical curriculum and give some general advice to future uh, medical students. So uh, again, I, my name is Emily. I'm a second year medical student at Li ka -Shing Faculty of Medicine, the University of Hong Kong also known as HKU Med. And in my pre-university studies, I did A-levels at Sunway College, Kuala Lumpur, and I got four A-stars in biology, chemistry, physics, and mathematics. So um, three sciences and one maths, that was my background. And I was originally from Batu Pahat, Johor, which is a small town in Johor. So why did I choose Hong Kong? First of all, I was very interested in the quality of education of Hong Kong. Um, I did this course online. It's now uh, available to the public. So if you guys are interested in joining this course, it's called So You Want to Be a Surgeon on edX platform. And this course, uh, it, it goes through many different surgeries like breast surgery, vascular surgery, neurosurgery. And through this course, it exposed me to a lot of the advanced technologies and the great facilities in HKU Med. So for example, they had this Da Vinci machine. I think it's it's in Malaysia, but um, knowing that it was in the hospital that I'll get to study at in my clinical years, it made me really excited. So the Da Vinci machine is like a, it's a microsurgery machine. It's a very non-invasive surgical technique, where it's kind of like you're playing video games to um, conduct surgery on the patient. And then 
uh, I was also very interested in the anatomy dissection programs. They use a RVR, which is virtual reality, to help you facilitate to help facilitate you with understanding the anatomy. So after going through these classes, I think they are quite useful in helping me solidify my anatomy knowledge. And also one of the main reasons I forgot to mention was the scholarship. So um, HKU Med gave me a full tuition scholarship, which is a renewable scholarship, meaning that uh, every year I have to achieve um, an expected grade for me to have full tuition for the next year. But the grade that you're ex uh, expected to achieve is pretty okay, like it's pretty achievable. And um, for anyone here who's not just into medicine, maybe you're into biomedical sciences or computer science or engineering, this scholarship is also uh, um, accessible to anyone in any faculty. So it doesn't have to be medicine to get for you to get a full tuition scholarship. And lastly, um, one of my reasons was because of the enrichment year program. The enrichment year is it's a, a very exciting year and I will go into more detail of the enrichment year. The enrichment year is the third year of our MBBS degree. Okay, and um, location wise, I felt like Hong Kong was, was close to home, but it's not close like Singapore, like just next to us. So I liked how it, I wanted to kind of get out of that 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 space on earth and anyway and the public transport is also really good so I felt like that would be a really good social life and I could I could appear at a different place in a matter of a few seconds because of the the very systematic and accessible public transport so yeah those are the main reasons why I chose Hong Kong here can you guys see clearly so this is like our medical campus this is this is our medical campus and um, we this is the rooftop view of one of our buildings. And for example, this one, um, outside our study area, there's a small area where you can sit outside and you can bathe in the sun and you can even study there. And then you have a nice view of the ocean. And actually, because it's so close to the, the ocean, you can take a bus right down or you can even just walk down and then you'll get to a beach, like a, a beach. So it's, it's like it's surrounded by a lot of water. It's really nice. Okay. Oh. So that that uh the pictures I showed you just now, that was the medical campus. But if you're in HK, you're in HKU, you will also be near the main campus. This is the HKU's main campus. And oh sorry. This is uh this is the Centennial campus, which is also part of the main campus. And if you look up the University of Hong Kong. This is one of the main places where people take pictures. So it's a really nice, really nice complex. It's quite a big campus. Okay, moving on to the application process. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about the general flow. So if you wanna start your application, you have to go to the application portal. It opens for for the first round, I'm pretty sure it opens around November, like you, or October, November. You have to apply October, November. And then there's a second round if you miss the first round. So I actually missed the first round. I applied in January. But yeah, you apply through the application portal. Then after that, for medicine specifically, you'll receive an invitation for the interview. And you actually have to fly to Hong Kong for the interview. And they'll notif after that, they'll notify you of your acceptance, waitlist, or rejection. So actually, in my experience, it was during COVID. So I didn't have to fly to Hong Kong. My interview was conducted online. But sadly, now, because um, it's more normal and there's no more quarantine in Hong Kong, you kind of have to fly over here. Mm. But generally, I don't think they're not going to pay for your flight. But if you get in, I do think it's quite... It, I don't think it's quite worth it for you to spend some money on the flight ticket to, you know, get into a really good medical school. So yeah, it's, it's up to you. Uh, some stuff that you'll need for your application is you'll need your personal statement. You'll need two reference letters and your English proficiency test. They accept IELTS, but they also accept SPM 0009. So you can use these two, these two English proficiency um, qualifications. They also need your CV. Um, 
for anyone who doesn't know, the CV is just, it's like when you apply for a job or you apply for a university, it's, uh, it's a list of your academic achievements or what you did in terms of extracurriculars, your leadership, etc. It's just a detail of you as a student. And um, UK, UKCAT, BMAT, they are not required. However, if you did take the UKCAT and BMAT, there is an option for you to list it in your application, in the application portal. So let's say you did really well in, in your UKCAT, maybe you're like top 10 percentile. You can put it up there and I'm pretty sure it will impress the, 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 the officers, yeah, admission officers. And the minimum entry requirement is four A stars. I repeat minimum. If you don't have four A stars, you, you are not eligible to come in. Three A stars, one A, they do not accept that. But if you get four A stars, that's actually the requirement for the full tuition scholarship. So it's kind of an all or nothing situation. You get four A stars, you come in with full scholarship. If you don't get four A stars, you, you can't come in, you, you get nothing. And for intakes, there's only one intake and it's in September. On average, 280 to 300 students are accepted every year. I know this is quite a big figure compared to the other medical schools in Malaysia, but that's because in Hong Kong, there are only two medical schools in the entire Hong Kong. So that's why they accept such a big pool of students. But just to remind you guys, I think only about 5% of that 300 student body is our internationals are like fully non-local internationals. Actually, even now looking at my batch, I think I'm the only international that's fully international. Other internationals like Koreans or Americans or Indians, they, they have the Hong Kong permanent residency. So yeah, just keep that in mind. Am I talking too fast? If, if I'm talking too fast uh, or I'm talking too slow, please, you can text in the group, in the in the chat box or someone can remind me. Uh, okay. Now I'll be talking about the interview. So the interview is a very important component of your application because that's where they assess your personality and see if you're suited to becoming a doctor. And in this interview, they will test your Cantonese proficiency. But if you really can't use... Uh, Cantonese, you can use Putonghua. Putonghua is also known as Mandarin. Um, so just the common Mandarin that you guys speak in, in high school or with your family, if you're Chinese, of course. Okay. And then points to take no note of is uh, they test you on your critical thinking, your problem solving, your abstract thinking, and your Cantonese proficiency. Abstract thinking is kind of like, they'll give you a really deep quote and then you'll kind of have to dissect it like philosophically. And then for critical thinking problem solving, it's kind of similar to the MMI questions that you guys see on uh, in the UK system. So they'll give you a scenario, oh, you're a doctor and then it's COVID. For example, you're a doctor and then it's um, in COVID era. And then there's a child in the hospital, but due to restrictions, the mother isn't able to the mother is not allowed to enter to see her child. What would you do in that situation? So very situational questions where you have to think on your feet and give an answer of what you would do in a professional context. Um, secondly, do not understand the do not underestimate the importance of your attire. You should dress professionally when you fly to Hong Kong. And also, if you can't speak Cantonese, don't worry. I couldn't speak Cantonese as, as well. I only started learning Cantonese when they sent me the interview, the, the letter for the interview, because I actually had no idea that you had to speak Cantonese to be in Hong Kong. It didn't register to me that if I went to Hong Kong, I would need Cantonese. So remember to remember to maybe brush up or like, you can learn Cantonese in a very short period of time, I think, if you can speak Mandarin already, because Cantonese and Mandarin are quite similar in terms of the syllables. Yeah. Uh, but just to give some context, when I was during the when I was in my interview and they asked me the question in Cantonese, I couldn't understand it at all, and I had to ask them to repeat the question in Mandarin. So they repeated the question in Mandarin, and actually I still couldn't understand it because their Mandarin was really bad. But I managed to answer in a mixture of Cantonese, Mandarin, and English. So. 
as long as you show that you try, even if your Cantonese isn't good, as long as you try, I think they will see it as a commendable trait. And last thing, I think this one's quite important. Make sure to read up on Hong Kong news. They will ask you about Hong Kong, Hong Kong's news in, in your interview. And research on the four pillars of medical ethics, there is quite a common or quite popular question. About Hong Kong news, um, some medically related news now could be the, there's a medical malpractice recently. So they put two doctors in jail because they accidentally, well, they didn't really kill the person. Well, they killed the person. Well, the person died, but I wouldn't say it's debatable whether they are at fault, but maybe that's one of the examples of um, Hong Kong medical news that you should keep up with. Yeah. Okay, moving on. I'm going to be talking about uh, life in Hong Kong and see if you guys enjoy it. So nature is a big thing in Hong Kong. There's a lot of really great places for outdoors activities. So there's cycling. This is actually a cycling trail. And there's hiking. There's a lot of hiking. There's so, so many trails for hiking, so many. And then there's also kayaking. The living expenses would be around 4,000 to 5,000 Hong Kong D. That's about 3,000 Malaysian ringgit. Three, yeah, 3,000, 283,000 Malaysian ringgit um, a month. And it depends on your lifestyle. Some people, they spend a lot. They go clubbing a lot. So if you go clubbing a lot, then you might spend up to 7,000 Hong Kong D. But if you are quite thrifty with your money and you don't eat, at places that are too expensive, I would say 4,000 Hong Kong D is more than enough to sustain a living. And there's also plenty of tutoring or part-time working opportunities because there's a big tutoring culture in Hong Kong. So if you just send like your resume to a Facebook group for, um, for people to look for tutors, and then you say that you're a medical student, like most of the time you'll be able to get a good job. Okay, so these are some hiking places. This is Lantau Peak. Lantau Peak is like the second highest peak in Hong Kong. And I this was Lion's Rock. Yeah, this was Lion's Rock. And then this is uh, Red Incense Burner Hill. But not that you guys would remember these names, but I wanted to show you that this is like the, is this the island part of Hong Kong? Yeah, I think this is Hong Kong Island. And then this is the Kowloon side of Hong Kong. So you can see the two islands of Hong Kong. It's quite cool. And then uh, this was a really nice place as well. They had a really good sunset. So yeah, hiking is a, is a great activity in Hong Kong. Okay, there's great food as well. So here you guys. Uh, the dim sum here is good. They have great desserts. There's mango mochi. These are fish balls. I know you can get fish balls in Malaysia, but these fish balls are really nice. Mm. Oh, the sunset is the sunsets are really good, but the weather is usually sunny here, so it's not like the UK. It's not going to be gloomy, but when it sucks, it's like three days you'll be raining nonstop. Like today was today today's rain was so bad, my umbrella broke. Yeah, most of the time weather is pretty good. Um, and then there's also a lot of museums and art galleries that you can explore. Yeah, Hong Kong's art culture is pretty big I would say okay now I'm gonna move on to talk about the medical curriculum so unlike Malaysian the normal Malaysian curriculum and uh, most UK degrees the medis the MBBS degree is in Hong Kong U is six years yeah so you have six years because the third year is actually an enrichment year I'll go into that later so the first two years are the preclinical years. In the preclinical years, we have IASM, Introduction to Art and Science of, Science of Medicine. So it's like a foundation block. It'll be repeating a lot of concepts, I guess, in A-levels, but then it's actually quite a difficult block as well. You have basically everything. You have the law, the public health. You have the, the basic biochemical sciences. Uh, yeah, basic biochemistry, sorry. And then... 
moving on, you have CPRS. This was a really interesting block. So they put the lungs, the heart, and the, the kidneys together. And you kind of see how these three sim uh, systems, sorry, you kind of see how these three systems link up and complement each other. And moving on, you have GIS, gastrointestinal system. This was for, I, I just, I'm, oh yeah, this, this is my year right now. You have GIS, musculoskeletal, and then you have a formative assessment and then uh, HNNS. This was a really difficult, probably probably the most difficult block. And then we had HIS, hematology, immunology. And lastly, now we're having, we're currently in endocrine and reproductive systems. Uh, so you can see that there's only two exams throughout the academic year. So the first exam, this exam doesn't matter at all. It doesn't matter. You can fail this exam and you'll still be fine. Uh, this exam does matter. This exam is very important. So whether or not you get your scholarship renewed, it will. they will look at this exam. Um, yeah. Whether or not you pass, whether or not you have to repeat the entire year, they look at this final, this final these two final exams. So these two final exams are important. These two are useless. And then we also have a practical Chinese course in June uh, where we learn Cantonese terms, Cantonese medical terms, yeah. Okay, and our third year is the enrichment year. Enrichment year is like a fun year, it's a break basically. Uh, then I'm not really sure about year four to year six because I'm not in clinical years yet, but, oh, sorry, but yeah just to show you guys a bit a brief look at the clinical years so year four then you have year five year six you go into rotations of general medicine surgery um, emergency palliative care ophthalmology and then you have these are like the small small like specialty clerkships yeah so in our medical curriculum, we we use we have PBLs. So PBL is basically you have a group of 10 people, 9 to 10 people, depending on your group. And then you're given a patient presentation. You look at the patient's symptoms. Uh, this person has this person person has a family history of breast cancer. And then right now they're experience they're experiencing pain in their left breast or um, there, there's dimpling of the nip, the dimpling of the skin, there's retraction of the nipple, and then you have to go in and then talk about the patient. Like what other symptom, what other symptoms do you want to look out for? What investigations do you want to do? Um, what physical examinations you want to perform on them? Yeah, etc. That's basically just you're investigating a case. And then we have anatomy dissections as well. So it, this is a picture of our anatomy dissections. Together with your PBL group, you everyone is given a whole body and then you just you cut through the structures and you identify the nerves, the blood vessels, every single muscle. Yeah, it's pretty fun. Well, it's pretty fun. Yeah. Some some people would say no, but I think anatomy dissections are quite interesting. Then we also have clinical skills. We have compulsory shadowing activities. Shadowing activities, they will link us, the faculty does this for us. They link us to like um a family doctor or a dermatologist, someone who's more chill. And then we shadow them a few times and then we have to write a report on it. And basically it's a really good way to get that exposure, that experience of like, oh, this is gonna be me in the future as a doctor. So yeah, I think these shadowing activities are a really good opportunity as well. And lastly, we have medical humanities. Medical humanities, they're not a very big component of our syllabus, but I think it's a very refreshing course because you pick a course under the medical humanities program that you're interested to dive in. So for example, I chose a I chose a course on modern parenting or yeah, like starting a family and how a pregnant woman goes through her pregnancy journey. And I think that was quite enlightening. Yeah. There's also other courses like LGBTQ, um, transgenderism in medicine. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot. Oh, okay. So I'm, now I'm going to be talking about the scholarships and opportunities. So 
my scholarship was actually the HKU entrance scholarship, but then because entrance scholarship, that's the name for the first year. So in the second year, I met the targeted grades for my first year. And so they renewed my scholarship and they changed the name to Lee Xiao Qi Scholarship. The HKU entrance scholarship is el eligible to anyone from any faculty. Uh, if you get four A stars, Actually, recently they increased the criteria to you need five A stars to confirm secure your scholarship. But actually, I know of some other people who they got four A stars and they could still get full scholarship or full tuition. So yeah, HKU entrance scholarship. There's also the Hong Kong Belt and Road Scholarship. Um, this one is under Hong Kong's government, so this is also full tuition. I think it's full tuition. I'm not sure if there's expenses, like living expenses covered, but this is also a pretty good scholarship. There's also another scholarship I didn't type here. There's a he for she scholarship. So if you did something very remarkable in terms of, um, sorry, in terms of gender equality, or you had some breakthroughs through life that, that were really, really huge, then yeah, they would give you these scholarships. Uh, there's basically, there's plenty of scholarships under HKU. But outside of HKU, if you don't manage the security scholarship, scholarships, it's all right. There's this Malaysian Chamber Fund. It gives you 40,000 Hong Kong V per year, which it isn't enough to cover your entire tuition, but still it helps with your living expenses. And it's also not, this is not like an exclusive situation. So let's, for example, you have the HKU entrance scholarship, you have full tuition already. You can also apply to the Malaysian Chamber Fund for your living expenses. So you get both scholarships. That's also possible. But the Malaysian Chamber Fund, they look mainly at your financial background. So you need to be someone, you, you don't need to be someone, but they preferably choose people from um, poorer living conditions. Okay, and like I said, the enrichment year, this third year is really exciting because it's a whole year for us to sort of take our minds off medicine. We don't have to study. And these are the, opportunities that we're given to do. So there's intercalation opportunities. For example, I have like a few friends next year planning to go to Harvard for a master's degree in bioethics, or they go to Columbia for bioethics. Yeah, so these, and then there's um, bachelor degrees in the UK, the US, like Manchester, Queen Mary. Uh, there's a lot of master degrees, master degree opportunities out there. There's also research attachments. You can do these research attachments in Hong Kong or overseas. There are service and humanitarian um, opportunities to Philippines and Uganda. Like, this one is so exciting. I have a friend going to Uganda next year and oh, it's so exciting. She's gonna, I think she's gonna help out with like an orphanage or something over there. And then the last option is an overseas exchange program where you liaise with uh, another university and then you you go for a, one semester or maybe a full year of exchange. And you don't have to study medicine if you don't want to. I mean, you, you technically can. You can choose like neuroscience or biology. To, you can study that for one semester. But, but you can also do something completely different like music or finance. So it's a really good opportunity to self-discover. Or you can also use it to like enrich yourself and enrich your CV. Um, one thing that's really good about the enrichment year is the faculty has already communicated with these universities to say, hey, can you please leave a few spots for our students? So for example, the Harvard one or the Columbia University one, they already liaised with them and said, hey, can you leave like three or four spots for our students to go to your university? And so you have a better chance of getting into these uh, places to do your degrees. That's why, um, yeah, the instrument your the faculty helps a lot with this. Um, and then in terms of societies, there's there's Asian Medical Student Association, medical outreachers does a lot of humanitarian stuff, and this year, like, they kept going to a lot of overseas places. What was that? Oh, what's that? The name of the country. Okay, but I I don't remember, but it's somewhere near India. So there's a lot of service humanitarian work over there and a lot of conferences as well. And then there's medical society and there's many, many more, many more sub societies, but these three societies are the big societies, like the main societies. 
Okay. Um, uh, and that was quite. What time is it? Oh, okay. So, to the okay, it's a general advice session now. So, to the aspiring medical students or uh, aspiring doctors, medical school is going to be very tough. You're gonna have to sacrifice your time, but it doesn't have to be that way. You can also strive for a life that's more balanced. Medical school, it depends on how much you want to dedicate to your academics. It's like a pie chart. If you dedicate like 80% of your time to your academics, your grades, you want to be top of the class, then yes, it's going to be very tough, very, very tough. But if let's say you dedicate like 50% and then you have another 50 to dedicate to your hobbies, to your family, to your friends, to exercising, to your mental health that doesn't necessarily mean that you will perform poorly in medical school okay it's like it's all about balance so just um always the advice i would give to new medical students is always put your mental health per first because if your mental health or your physical health is bad your grades are going to be bad if you throw away your social life you're going to be very depressed you're going to be very anxious and that's not going to help you study so do not throw away your passions your hobbies or your friends for medical school and if you truly enjoy helping people um, the art of medicine if you truly enjoy human anatomy biology then you will definitely thrive in this career path and uh, that's it this is this picture by the way was one of my shadowing activities this guy is um, he's a family medicine doctor and then I basically shadowed him a few times to see how he treats his patients Okay, yeah, so uh, that's the end of my sharing. I'll pass the mic to Evangeline. Thank you, Emily, for this informative presentation. It really felt beneficial to those having doubts on their future as a medical student in Hong Kong. I hope this sharing session has provided everyone with useful information. Now, without further ado, we can move on to our Q&A session. You can drop your questions down in the link, Slido link provided in the chat below. And let's move on to our Q&A questions. Okay, let's go to the first question. First question is, is clinical experience important for application? Uh, sorry, Emily, we can't hear you. I, you're still on mute. Sorry. Uh, I'm... Yeah. Uh, clinical experience. Okay, so remember how I said, eh, can you guys hear me? Okay, right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I think the short answer would be no. I don't think it's important. The most important thing is your your grades, like four A stars. And then when you send your, if you're sending, you're going to be sending your predicted grades or your AS level grades, right? That is very important. I think Hong Kong's entire system is just, they look at grades the most. So if you don't have any clinical shadowing experience, um. I would say it's not important. Just make sure that you have the grades you have. If you have any academic achievements that would help as well, and then perform well in your interview. Like be very confident. Um, and having some leadership experience would also be good. I would say that's that's about it. Don't worry too much about clinical experience. Okay. And how early must we apply for the September intake the year before? They start the September intake. So there are two application cycles. The first cycle, it ends around November 10, 11 to 17. So if you're applying for the September intake of the next year, the October, October, November of the previous year, you should already be applying. That's the first cycle. But even if you miss that cycle, like I missed that cycle, you can still apply uh, January, March, January, January, February, March, around that area, around that timeline. The thing about HKU's, um, the thing about HKU's application system is it's very messy. They don't really care when you apply. You just, you just apply whenever you want. There are some people they apply in August and July, and they can still come in, but maybe they come in a little bit late. But I would suggest you to apply around um, the November, the, the first cycle, if possible. Because if you apply late, 
you might not have time. They might not have time to get you to come to Hong Kong for the interview. Yeah. In conclusion, try to apply the first cycle, October to November. Okay. How old were you when you entered HKU and was it difficult to live alone far from home? How old was I? I think I was... How old am I now? I'm 21 now. I think I was 20, 19. I, I was 19 when I entered HKU. Uh, it wasn't really difficult to live far from home, but it's because when I was in A-levels, I was already away from home for a year and a half. I was in Kuala Lumpur, but my home is in Batu Pahat, Johor. So I was already accustomed to living um, away from my family. But there were times where I, I was very, very homesick and like I really miss home or I felt like I didn't belong here. Everyone here speaks Cantonese. I can't really speak Cantonese. It was really hard to make friends. So that was the social aspect of my life here was quite tough in the beginning of my first year. But overall, I think people just adapt and you you just you learn how to get accustomed to the culture. You learn who to be friends with, who to not be friends with. And yeah, everything will sort itself out. So for anyone who's worried about living abroad and studying abroad, I would say just be confident and throw your, put yourself out there, get out of your comfort zone. You're going to be fine. Everything will be fine. Do you apply for the scholarships after receiving admission into the uni? Oh, no, I applied for, for example, the entrance scholarship that I'm under, that one, um, you don't have to apply for it. They consider every single applicant while they are, uh, they consider every single applicant for the scholarship while they are admitting you as well. So if you get four A stars, automatically you can get the, the entrance scholarship. But the Malaysian Chamber Fund, the other one, the 40,000 Hong Kong D per year scholarship, I did apply for it, but I didn't get accepted. I think it's because, well, again, they look at your family background and obviously if you're someone who already has a full tuition scholarship, they're less likely to admit you. But I think as you come here, you will see like the, the, the university will keep emailing you new scholarships to apply for. So even when you're here, you can still see what scholarships can apply for um, and then see if you can get them. So don't worry. Is the course taught in English and how important is Cantonese in the learning experience? The course is taught completely in English. Um, Cantonese in the learning experience, I would say not that important except for the clinical part. But the thing is in the preclinical years, you're you have very little clinical sessions. You don't, you're not exposed to patients yet, but we will have classes where we are taught clinical skills. For example, how to perform an eye examination on someone, how to perform a reflex examination on a patient. And you'll have to go through this process in Cantonese. That is the only part where it's important. And even so, don't worry. There, there are plenty of students in our, our medical cohort that can't speak Cantonese. So they prepare like a script for us to, to uh, memorize. So you can still memorize all of the Cantonese. Oh, I forgot how you, actually they will test this in your exam. You have a clinical exam where you have to speak Cantonese to the patient, but it's okay. Cause everything is, you can just memorize everything. Um, the course is the course. However, the lectures, they're all taught in English. So overall, I would say not that much Cantonese. But remember, in these two years of preclinicals and also your enrichment year, you have to pick up Cantonese. Because if you can't, then when you get to your clinical years, how are you going to face the patients? You're going to actually be facing patients and they expect you to speak Cantonese at that time. So do while you're simultaneously doing medicine, you also have to learn Cantonese. Okay. Um, did JPA sponsor your pre-university and your uni applications? JPA, JPA sponsored me for Sunway. Initially, I was under Jeffrey Chia and then because my SPM came out and then I got JPA, so JPA took over. A-levels was paid. But then uni application, if it's like overseas, they I was under the, I was under the local scholarship. I wasn't under the overseas scholarship. But even so, 
technically I'm supposed to be paying them back for the A-levels, but they haven't contacted me to pay them back. So I don't know what happened. But anyway, for now, no, they're not paying me for my university. <laughs> Let's hope they never contact you back again. I was so... <laughs> After all, you're text paying Malaysians. Yeah. <laughs> Is it's everyone every... supposed... Sorry, were you saying something? Oh, no, I was reading the question. Oh, okay. Is everyone super smart and how do you cope with the academic pressure? Is everyone in Hong Kong super smart? Yes, I was very intimidated at first. They are very, I don't know if I would say smart, but they're very confident. They're all very confident. So at first I thought, wow, everyone must be so smart. But then as you go through medicine, you realize if someone doesn't work hard, they're not going to perform well anyways in the exams. So there are some people where maybe they got like IB 45. I'm not here shaming people. I'm just stating like a fact. You can get IB 45. You can get four A stars in your A levels and you can still repeat or fail your exams if you do not work hard. So yes, everyone is intrinsically very talented and smart, but um, that doesn't necessarily like translate to having very good grades. And how I cope with the academic pressure, I make sure that I don't, I make sure I don't like, I make sure my lectures do not pile up. Because HKU's format is you have lectures every week and sometimes it gets, it gets very spammy. Like they'll spam like 17 lectures a week in your face and you have to clear up everything. So the way I do it is I make sure I dedicate and enough time to, enough time to clear up my lectures and I just do my, flashcards so that's why I make sure I am never behind on any of my lectures it is very easy to go behind on your lectures if you if you skip for like one week you'll suddenly have maybe 20 lectures up your pile so just make sure that you're on track you don't stay behind and you should be uh, that's how I that's how I cope with the academic pressure yes um, is your qualification from HKU accepted overseas or will you have to do a qualification exam if you were to practice in countries like Australia, UK or the US? Hmm. I, I did some research before. I know it's accepted from Singapore, but I think for other countries like Australia, US, US you have to do the USMLE. Um, Australia, I've never checked, but and UK, sorry, I'm burping. Oh, there are like cases of uh, Hong Kong doctors going to the UK to practice, so I'm pretty sure it's possible, but I think most likely you would need to do a qualification exam. In any country, it works that way. Even if, if I want to go back to Malaysia, I'll have to do the Malaysian licensing exam. And I think I have to get monitored by one of the junior doctors to see if I'm okay. Okay. And any tips on writing a good CV? Right. Is having a good CV important for your application? I think... Is having a good CV important for your application? It helps if you have a good CV. If you have a good CV, you naturally you're gonna have a good personal statement because you have a lot of good things to write about. But um, my advice would be if you're starting early now, maybe you just started A levels or whatever the or whatever pre U degree you're doing now, just do more activities and do more things that are medically related if you're very sure that you want to do medicine. So for example, um, for example, for me, I did I couldn't get clinical research uh, clinical experience sorry I couldn't get clinical experience I didn't shadow a doctor so what I did was I did a research attachment under Sunway University because it's it's just close to Sunway and I think maybe Taylor's I'm pretty sure there's there's um, medical research being done in the medical university so getting these research attachments would really help you would help expose you and it would be very good for both your personal statement and your CV uh, and also specifically about the CV. The CV is different from the personal statement. The CV is where you list down your achievements. I would also say if you have a lot of chief achievements, don't list down too much. Just list, list down the achievements that are related to um, 
medicine or show good leadership qualities. Yeah. Okay. And is the applying process forms, etc. in Cantonese? Would you recommend someone who has absolutely no Cantonese knowledge to apply? Oh, no. It's... <laughs> no, the application for HKU is known as the most international diverse well so they say it's the most internationally diverse uh, university so it's very english friendly don't worry everything is in english would i recommend someone who has absolutely no canton yeah i would recommend it i couldn't speak cantonese at all like i i'm from batu pahat i'm from johor we speak fujian over there we don't speak cantonese so if you can't speak cantonese just please apply there's plenty of people around me that can't speak cantonese as well and slowly you'll pick it up and then you'll eventually pick it up I, that's what i would say don't let the language be a barrier and and see it as oh if i go to hku i'll be forced to learn a new language so i'll have a new language to put under my belt you know indeed are there any other medical schools that you applied to and how did hku hku top all the other medical schools uh I didn't apply to anything else except for if medicine, I applied to UM. I applied to UM and I got in, but UM gave me the offer one month later because that's when their results release. Yeah, they were later than HKU. And then and then did I apply to, oh, I, I applied to NU, oh no, I didn't apply to NUS. I applied to NTU, so Nanyang Technology University in Singapore. But I didn't apply to the medical school. I applied for their other programs and they gave me computer science, but I didn't like computer science. So I ended up with HKU. And how did how did HKU top UM? Well, I felt like facilities-wise, HKU would have been better than University Malaya, although I know it's a very, very good university. I was initially very strongly thinking of going to UM because all of my friends were going to be there. And I know that the professors there are really, really qualified. So it's also a really good choice. But I just thought going to HKU, having that overseas experience and for HKU to be like international and having a better name, I thought I would have more opportunities that way. Yeah. Okay. And on a scale of 1 to 10, how hard was the application process compared to other medical schools? Oh, it was super easy. If you don't need... If you don't need like UK CAT or BMAT, it's gonna be very easy already. Like even UM, they needed they needed the BMAT exam. So I had to prepare for the BMAT exam for UM. But for HKU, they didn't care of care of um external exams. I would say 10. It was quite it was quite okay. Okay. Yeah. And is Accommod is accommodation provided on campus or did you have to outsource housing? How much is student accommodation or rental? Is accommodation provided on... Oh, uh, yeah. Accommodation is provided on campus. I'm currently living in an on-campus dorm. Uh, the rent is about... I didn't include rent into the living expenses. I'm so sorry. Rent is about... I remember converting it is about 1,000 ringgit a month. Yeah, roughly the amount, 900 to 1,000 ringgit a month. But um, just to be uh, to be very, very honest, we have to go through an, a process called readmission every single year. And you have to do activities in your accommodation or they call it here student hall. So if you don't do any activities, if you're very passive, then you might not get readmitted. You you probably would get kicked out and then you'll have to rent outside, which is very expensive. The, the rent in Hong Kong is very expensive. So if you choose to come to HKU, just bear that in mind. You might get you might be homeless for a small a small period of time. You might be. Just saying you might be. Okay. And um is there any bonds for the HK Belt and Road Scholarship? No, it's bondless. Uh, none of the scholarships that I listed have any bond. It it's not JPA. It's not JPA. <laughs> yeah. Um, how much is tuition fees per year without a scholarship? Uh, one. I'm gonna type the numbers down. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah. So it's one thousand seven hundred. No, 
one hundred seventy one. Ah, uh, yeah, one hundred and seventy one thousand Hong Kong D a year. If you convert that, that's like how many? How much? How many ringgit? Ah, uh? one seven one HKD to MYR. It's nine thousand ninety six thousand Malaysian ringgit a year. I would say that's oh. okay, lah. Like for the average Malaysian private university for medical school, I think it's roughly the same amount. Mm. Okay, and um, there's no bonds for the Malaysian Chamber Fund, right? No, no bond. Okay, and um, can all students do intercalation? And can you tell us more about it? Yeah. So, like I said, for enrichment year, there's research attachment, intercalation, there's overseas exchange and service. For intercalation, like there's no limit to oh, we we only set aside a number of students for research for intercalation. As many students can get into intercalation if they wanted to. There's many intercalation opportunities for bachelor's degree programs. Like if you want a bachelor in neuroscience and biomedical sciences, in functional and clinical anatomy, there's there's many options in the UK. I think there's most most of the intercalation opportunities are in the UK. There's Bristol. There's Manchester. There's Exeter. There's Oh my god, there's so many. I feel like I'm gonna go on a there's Queen Mary. Just basically you can go anywhere for intercalation. And for the US, for the US, there's only there's not that many for the US. There's only Harvard and Columbia. And both of them are master's programs, masters of bioethics. So you could do those two as well. Mm. But if you want to do bachelor programs in other countries. The problem with that is the timeline might not fit the intercalation opportunities are in US and UK. Mm. Okay. And um, will the scholarship still hold if students do a completely different course from medicine in a uni that is not in the Hong Kong? Uh, the scholar, is it? I think what they mean is if the if once they do the intercalation, will the scholarship still be applicable? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, wait, wait. Sorry. If you're doing exchange, like for me, I'm going to go on an exchange program to the US, then it's not an intercalation. I'm not going to I'm not going to get a bachelor's or master's degree from that, but the scholarship will still hold because I'm just doing an exchange. But if you want an intercalation to Queen Mary University, for example, then no, you would have to pay for yourself for that one year. But but there are plenty of scholarship opportunities. There's a whole list of scholarships you can apply to, and they give you a lot of money to finance your entire year if you want to be in a different country. So again, scholarship scholarship wise, I would say don't worry too much. Okay, and can you tell us more about the exchange year that you'll be doing? Can I enter? Take oh, oh, exchange year that I'll be doing. Oh, okay. So, oh, you mean my enrichment year? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, uh, and for my third year next year, the first semester I'll actually be doing research. I'll be doing research in Hong Kong, and I'm already doing the research right now. So that's why I decided to continue doing the research for my first semester in Hong Kong, and then for the second semester, I applied for an an exchange to California. Uh, I've gotten into UC, like University of California, but they haven't sent me the portal. I have, I don't know which campus specifically I'm going to go to, but I'm putting UCLA, which is University of California, Los Angeles, as my first choice, hoping I can get in. Uh, if not, then maybe I'll go to, there's San Diego, there's Berkeley, there's Irvine. But yeah, basically I'll, I won't be in Hong Kong for one semester and for that one semester I I haven't decided yet but I kind of want to do music for one semester just take music courses in a different country I kind of want to leave so medicine for it. <laughs> it yeah I think it's a good opportunity to explore another side of yourself that's not medicine indeed and our, our final question and very important for Taylor students, can students taking foundation in science enter HKU? 
I don't think so. I think on the website, they only accept A-levels for international. De they accept STPM, though. They accept STPM, A-levels, IB. I, even Australian mat matriculation is not accepted. So if you want to get into HKU, um, yeah, A-levels, STPM, or IB in Malaysia. I think like that that applies to general HKU, not just the medicine. Okay, so that is the end of our Q and A session. Thank you so much, Emily, for joining us today. And before we go, uh, please fill up the feedback form that we will be sending in the chat box. Um, only by filling up the form, you will get your certificate. And please follow our socials that we are showing you right now on our screen. And we hope that this event has helped you gain more insight about studying medicine in Hong Kong and hopefully build some confidence and motivation that you will need to attain your dreams. And as always, thank you for joining us on a weeknight and we hope you enjoyed yourself and had learned something from today's session. And don't forget to sign up for the Mad Memo. Important information and summary of each session will be available for you to look back at any time and do it by filling up the Google form below. Thank you so much, Emily, for joining us today. We appreciate you taking the time out to help us out. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you so much for inviting me. Okay. And thank you everyone for attending our set, uh, session. With this, I bid you all farewell and have a good evening.